Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for coming here today. My name is Kurt Volker. I have the honor of working with Cindy McCain and others in the McCain world and the Arizona State University world as the executive director of the McCain Institute. Uh, the McCain Institute was founded about four years ago with the explicit goal of being an action-oriented do tank as opposed to a think tank. The challenge that we set for ourselves was to not figure out what we could recommend that somebody else do, but what we could take on and make a difference in ourselves. And, and that was the ethos that was built. And it was built on a, a presumption of promoting values and character and promoting character-driven leadership, that each of us can exercise leadership and take responsibility and bring about change in our world, in our societies. Probably no program that we have launched at the McCain Institute has better exemplified that spirit of taking action and making a difference than the human trafficking work that we have done, uh, led by Cindy McCain and her work as the chairperson of our um, Human Trafficking Advisory Council, and her personal work as the co-chair of the Governor of Arizona's Task Force on Human Trafficking, and a number of other uh, events and activities she has taken on around the country and internationally. Uh, as an uh, institute, we have tried to think holistically about the problem of human trafficking and what we can do about it. We have done a lot of work in the area of public awareness and awareness raising, and I'll come back to that. We've also sponsored original research just to improve some of the data that we have about human trafficking. We've examined some of the patterns, such as whether large uh, public events such as the Super Bowl become a magnet for traffickers and how you can identify that. We've looked at the way the internet is used, both open internet and dark internet, in order to uh, advertise for sex services and to sell the, the services of minors uh, through the internet, and then how that can be turned back against traffickers by empowering them through technology and software, and, and, or empowering law enforcement through technology and software so they can do a better job of finding patterns and tracking them down. That's something we've done in partnership with another NGO called Thorn, uh, which has developed software that does exactly that for law enforcement. We provided uh, training for law enforcement and social services personnel. We've done targeted awareness raising. We've created a student alliance against trafficking at universities in Arizona, and that is soon going nationwide. Uh, we have worked with Native American communities that are particular victims uh, of human trafficking. There's a wide array of things that we have tried to do where we have felt that we can make a direct impact, a direct difference. And I honestly believe that we have. But probably the most significant thing, as simple as it seems, is simply raising public awareness. Because when we started this about four years ago, and Cindy will back me up on this, there was a perception that this isn't a problem or not a big one. And even if it is a problem, well, what do you do about it? And I think after four years, that perception is radically different, that there is a widespread perception that it is a problem. There is a uniform, universal intolerance for human trafficking. No one would be lenient on this or, or condone this or look the other way anymore. And there is a whole menu of things, specific things, that can and should be done to combat it that people are in favor of. And we've seen that uh, many, many ways time and again. Uh, one of the principal ways we've done the public awareness raising has been Cindy McCain's own efforts, a conversation series with people who've been active in a fight against trafficking that we can shine a spotlight on uh, in order to highlight the work that they're doing and make people more aware what the problem is and what some of the solutions are. Uh, we've had a series of Leadership Voices conversations which uh, focus people on their own leadership activities. What can an individual do? Uh, we've done billboard advertising. We've put advertising on the light rail between Tempe and Phoenix in Arizona. Anything we can think of that is going to make a difference, and I think we really have. Uh, one of the people who has made a difference on this is with us today to introduce the first panel, and that is Senator Heidi Heitkamp. And she and Cindy McCain and Senator Klobuchar, who is here this morning, have traveled together, have highlighted this issue together. She sponsored legislation. They've held hearings. They have drilled down deeply on this issue to try to find ways through legislation to empower 
law enforcement, to empower intelligence collection, to empower social services, and to protect victims. Uh, and one of the first steps, and you'll hear this throughout the discussions today, is to make sure that victims are indeed treated as victims and not as criminals themselves. Uh, so with that, and to introduce our first panel, we have a um, distinguished senator here with us, Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, in particular to the McCain Institute. Um, they have, uh, through Cindy's leadership, absolutely been the premier uh, nonprofit NGO um, think tank and emotional mover on this issue of human slavery, of human trafficking. And um, I, I tell a couple stories, I guess, um, just to give you by way of background. I'm a former attorney general. And as Attorney General, I had the Bureau of Criminal Investigation under my jurisdiction. We did a lot of law enforcement work. But I became Attorney General in 1992. And in 1992, no one really believed, if you can imagine this, that domestic violence was a crime. In fact, most domestic violence programs were housed in public health. This was a public health problem. This was a family law problem. This was a problem that needed counseling and not incarceration. Um, an amazing thing happened in a just a little fit of um, go women um, into public office. A number of women got elected attorney general and uh, attorneys general, and across the country, um, unbeknownst to all of us, we started saying something that was novel at the time, which is when there is violence in the family, there's violence against society, and it needs to be prosecuted. And if we're going to prevent violence, those names need to be in the paper and they need to be charged. We need to expose the victimization. We need to expose this as what, for what it is, which is aggravated assault. And in my state, um, uh, at least 50% of all homicides were a result of domestic violence, um, the consequences of domestic violence. So we, so, so we started talking about it. We started talking about violence in the family. And we started saying things need to change. And I was a crusader um, for a couple personal reasons that involved a case that I took pro bono. But, you know, I just went out. And my job was to educate law enforcement. And I remember one of my first tours around the state of North Dakota. I was in, in my home community, my home county, um, and I was meeting with a number of um, law enforcement officials. And I said, you know, this is a crime. We can't allow this to happen. We have got to change how we look at family violence and violence against women and children. And this old police officer came up to me after um, my discussion, and he literally put his finger in my face, and I was a lot younger then. And he said, listen here, girly. Men will always beat their wives, and you can't stop them. And I thought, what do you say to that? And then I said something pretty simple. I said, you might be right. I sure hope you're not right, but you might be right. But I said, the one thing I do know, we cannot live in a world where we don't try because that's failure. That is conceding. That is giving up. And we cannot give up. We cannot give up when the consequences of violence, the consequences of, of victimization, the consequences of something as horrific as these crimes has such dire and serious consequences for all of us. We are all diminished. We are all diminished when we do not tackle this problem. And when we accept a culture of failure, when we say we just can't see any way that we can stop this kind of violence. I'll tell you one, one other story before I introduce the panel. And it involves our work um, with uh, Prevent Child Abuse North Dakota. Um, we, we were trying to find some way to educate legislators who are responsible in large measure for appropriations on what we could do to help them understand um, violence uh, against children. And so I had this idea, or somebody in our group had this idea, that we would do like the Holocaust Museum. We would get a pair of children's shoes for every child that had been where there had been an indicated report of child abuse and neglect. Not reported, but an indicated report, which meant there was suspicion that this was true. And we would, we would put these shoes into the Great Hall in, at the state capitol. And we would, we would you know, demonstrate the impact and the number of children who every day suffered 
um, uh, as victims of uh, sexual assault and violence in, and neglect. So we got all these shoes together, and you know there was there was a lot of them. I think there was maybe a thousand, which in our state is huge. And you know you translate a given population, huge. And these legislators would come by and they would say, "What is this?" And I would explain because I sat out there. I would explain that these are the. He goes, "You mean in the country?" And I said, "No, in our state of North Dakota." And they go, "Well, I don't believe it." I don't believe it. It's too horrific for people to look. When they look, they have to see, and they have to believe, and they have to then do what you're all doing here, do what we're trying to do in this country, which is take responsibility as a society to change, to take responsibility for the change that we know needs to come. And when we all take that responsibility, when we all stand up in communities and tell men, honestly, mainly men, you cannot buy small children and get by with it. Just like that family abuser all of a sudden had the risk of losing his job. If you're, if you're going to buy small children, you're going to be charged with a crime because it is what Cindy said it is. It is sexual assault against a minor, which is a crime in every state in this country. And it doesn't matter if he paid anyone. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, just to give you a sense of what's happening in my home state, um, I went around the state and law enforcement, which I'm familiar with because I was the attorney general, kept saying, Heidi, you just can't believe the amount of prostitution. We're just seeing it everywhere. And we just don't have time to investigate. So I thought about that and I started researching and I started talking to people and I started understanding that what we had known as prostitution had a much hor more horrific side. It's not just children. Many of the women who now are stuck in this lifestyle, began as children. They're entitled to the same amount of respect. We have to get over this distinction between minors and adults. Because when you interview women, you'll find out their life pattern and their life trajectory. And it wasn't, uh, it, they didn't begin this at age 18 or 21. This began much earlier for many of these women. And, and so when you, when you look, at, look at what's happening in communities, and you, 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 the, the law enforcement started getting involved, BCI did, and BCI did a sting in Dickinson, North Dakota. Dickinson you know, is, a, is a larger community than what it was a couple years ago because it's on the edge of the Bakken oil development. And um, they did a sting and they advertised 14-year-old kids. And they had to stop the sting because the jail was full. And they got two calls from two people who said, couldn't you make it a 12-year-old? Now, what I want to tell you from that story is when men tell you, I didn't know, of course they knew. Of course they knew. It, it defies imagination. They know exactly what they're doing. Backpages knows exactly what they're doing. And they're skirting and hiding behind a precious liberty that we have, which is the First Amendment, and we can't let them. We cannot let people hide behind our constitutional liberties so that they can do evil to children and women and our society. And so I want to um, now introduce this wonderful panel. And, um, you know, every once in a while in life, you find someone who inspires you, someone who, who, who just has the same amount of passion, um, has the same amount of, of vision, and has the same amount of optimism that society can change. And that person for me is Cindy McCain. You know, we talk about the most horrific thing that happens in America, but yet we remain optimistic because we know what's in every one of your hearts. We know that if we can reach your hearts, if she can reach out to every one of you and, and, and challenge you to do better, that we can all be better as a society. And then we also want to um, introduce Mr. Clark, who's with the National Missing and Exploited Children, um, which um, uh, very, very dear and near to my heart. I worked very closely with your organization when I was Attorney General. And um, just to, just to um, give you a shout out, last piece of introduction, um, you guys have rescued more children from this horrific challenge than anyone else in the world. We would love to take your organization, duplicate it, spread it near and far across the world, and you only need to tell us what you need us to do to help you to do that. And so you are going to just be inspired 
You're going to be horrified by the next panel, but hopefully you'll leave here with the same amount of optimism that I have because two really good people believe we can change the world. Thank you. Can you come forward? High Camp is the only person that I know of could get, that could get me into steel-toed boots <laughs> on oil well, and she did. <laughs> I went up to visit her in uh, North Dakota, and she took me on an amazing tour of the oil patch and uh, Indian country, and uh, it was very, uh, it, it, it was eye-opening, and it was also a precious honor to be able to to travel with and enjoy the company of someone who is impassioned about this this subject as we are. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Um, we, I am so excited to have you here today, Mr. Clark. You are an inspiration to all of us. And you're, you're, I was reading your bio. Um, and you have, you have such a vast understanding from the work that you have done. I'd first like to, to ask you to tell us, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and how this evolution has gotten you to Nick Mick, if you wouldn't mind. And Absolutely. welcome, and thank you for doing this. Thank you, yeah. Well, uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody. And I, I certainly want to thank you as well, McCain Institute, for having me here. Uh, it's always nice to be in a room full of fighters, uh, people who are engaged in uh, learning more about this is one of the most, I think, most important topics of our time. Uh, so I congratulate you in putting this, uh, this idea of, uh, of public awareness on this forum together. Um, well, as was noted, I've had uh, about a 36-year uh, service of, uh, in government and uh, in the corporate world. Uh, but it wasn't until really the last three months uh, when I joined the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, December the 7th, I've been here three months, not even quite, uh, that I really uh, found, uh, uh, I guess I'd call it a home. Uh, you know, during my Marshall Service career, a great organization going back to 1789 when George Washington appointed the very first Marshals to the present day, uh, one of those core duties that the Marshals uh, handle, of course, is the apprehension of uh, very dangerous criminals and fugitives, just like the days of old. Uh, so rather remarkably and somewhat ironically, uh, I'm sitting here on the stage as somebody who, uh, when I had darker hair and was a few pounds lighter, <laughs> Uh, actually arrested uh, sex offenders and those who had been involved in very uh, uh, serious crimes. Uh, but uh, moving forward now at the National Center for the Missing and Exploited Children, uh, I had this great opportunity to start shaping public policy, uh, shaping awareness. And uh, you know when you have what I call the alarm clock test every, every morning when you get up and you say, where am I going to work? Uh, what's the purpose of me going there? And I can tell you right now, uh, every single day, and I don't believe this is going to change for me, I'm, uh, I'm energized, invigorated, and ready to come to work because I know that this is a very, very important uh, task to find the missing and stop exploitation. And so that's, uh, that's the kind of the joy I have when I go to work every day. And uh, so I'm very, very honored and privileged to work in an organization like that. Well, thank you. Um... Heidi mentioned something that I thought was is very much a part of the, I know that we all talk about but for the for people that don't work in this on a daily basis is the tragedy of what's what happens and the the evil dark side that we tend to see yes. and why we keep doing this how we keep doing it uh, can we be doing it better um, Nick Mick has been such a leader on all of this so I guess what I'm asking you is, is I'd like to to hear from you um, the good things that are going on right now. We know the, the bad things, but I'd like to hear where your progress is at, and I know that you have lots of plans coming up, too. A little birdie told me that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, about a 32-year history, uh, as you may know, the organization developed sort of in a grassroots uh, uh, process when, uh, when John Walsh from America's Most Wanted fame and uh, his son uh, Adam was murdered, and that whole process of going through to be uh, the voice and the advocate for... Uh, uh, similar circumstances now, of course, we're missing and exploited as well. Uh, so the, the history is, is relatively rich and deep, but the focus has been primarily on, uh, on being that voice and that advocate to the present day uh, for those who are missing and those who are being exploited. 
But on the, um, the sex trafficking issue, those who are being exploited or the child pornography and all the other really uh, sort of dark uh, things that happen, uh, you can only uh, uh, imagine, I guess, is, is, in fact, it's hard to imagine, uh, to even get your hands around the scope uh, of what's happening. Uh, you know, in the days of old where uh, somebody would have to uh, drive to a certain part of town, perhaps, to find uh, uh, some type of illicit sexual liaison, uh, technology today, while it's been a, a, a blessing for us, uh, has also found a, a way to enable uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking at such a, a pace and such a level that it's very, very difficult to keep up with. So we're looking at uh, you know, strong partnerships uh, with technology organizations to find out how we can better uh, combat this particular problem uh, in, in terms of stopping the exploitation. Uh, we look for forums like this. Uh, education and awareness is extremely important. Uh, as was noted by the senator, uh, that you know, the more people know about it and the more involved they become in our present day, uh, the, the better that is. So the National Center wants to be uh, that place where uh, uh, anybody can come to find the right resources to get involved in this issue. So public awareness, very, very uh, important, and that's one of my uh, key objectives as well. The partnership side, you know, we're working with law enforcement at all levels, uh, federal, state, and local. Very, very uh, uh, important to us to partner with them. So on all these different plateaus, uh, we're trying to uh, be true difference makers when it comes to stopping exploitation mm -hmm. and particularly the, uh, the trafficking of, uh, of young minor children. You mentioned something uh, <clears throat> just, just now about the, the web and then the other web, the dark web. Um, I don't know about you, but when I thought I knew what the web was, you know, I do have my emails and I go on Google and all the other things that we do. And then it was explained to me by a very wonderful young man, Ashton Kircher, what the dark web was. And, you know, that, that moment of elation, I think, oh, we might be able to get our hands on the web. We can start tracking things. And then all of a sudden I realized we're nowhere near being able to fix this because of this, this other element in this. How do we, aside from using every tool we have with national security interests, and, and how can we as a country help curb the dark web, or can we? Or is this just something we're going to have to, to learn to, to work around? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, public policy debate because on the one hand, uh, you know, we want the freedoms we all enjoy to be able to communicate with the devices that we have and use the, uh, the web for uh, the good intended purposes that we all use it for. Uh, but on the, uh, the dark side or the bad side of that, of course, the web is used to uh, traffic in, in minor children. Uh, I mean, imagine for a second that, uh, again, you can take uh, an iPhone and look through ads through the dark web or through other uh, illicit uh, sites and uh, in order, uh, like you would order a pizza, for example, uh, a minor child uh, that would be um, of a certain uh, type or one that, that, that an individual would say they desire, and have that child delivered to the very spot where you want them to be delivered. Again, almost like ordering a pizza. A, yeah. And so you think about the, the horrific uh, uh, bad side, if you will, of the web where that can be done. So it's making it very, very difficult <clears throat> for, um, for law enforcement uh, or to put public policy around this or, or to actually being able to, uh, to track those types of offenders. And so there, there is some difficulty in, uh, for sure in doing that. But I would look forward to, uh, in our organization, is working with uh, members of Congress and others to try to find a good way to combat that. I, I, this occurred to me this morning while I was listening to the news. Uh, the whole iPhone issue, whether we break the codes, get the codes, whatever it may be, that's not what this discussion is about. But the ability to, to um, the ease that you talked about, about being able to pull a child, you know, order a child online on, my phone, on your phone or, or something similar to that, it is of concern. So how do you, where do, where do our, our rights, you know, our, the, the rights that our Constitution gave us and, and the rights of these children, on the other hand, come into play? How do we balance that? Sure, you know, and I think parents want their uh, children to grow up in a, in a, uh, in a way that is like, like most typical uh, children to be able to enjoy uh, 
you know, having the friends they want to have and using uh, the computer and uh, the, the web and talking on cell phones and all those kinds of things that youngsters do these days. Uh, at the same time, it starts early in their age, I think, with some awareness level, too, about making sure that, uh, you know, young children understand uh, that there are certainly some, uh, some hazards and dangers on, on the web. <clears throat> in, in addition to that, when you talk about the freedoms of, uh, you know, like when you're talking with members of Congress and others, about how we can actually uh, find the right public policy to protect our children right. so that they're not using that uh, in, a, in a way it's going to be harmful to them, uh, but at the same time allowing them to have these freedoms. So we're working very hard on uh, good education and prevention campaigns. You know, we, we want parents, we tell parents, uh, be aware of what uh, your child is doing uh, when they're surfing on the web. Uh, we have a whole uh, educational program we have in all 50 states now uh, working in schools to educate uh, young children uh, as well as parents about, you know, how they can use technology in a good and productive and safe way. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm actually very grateful. Mine are all grown now. And we were just, as teenagers, just getting into the Internet a little bit. I mean, so I, as a mother, uh, I'm just so grateful I didn't have to deal with that portion of it. Um, our problem, at least in our neighborhood where we were at, was the parent that didn't believe it was a problem. And so the, I'm sure you all have, have encountered some of this, the, the, the kid that sent the picture, you know, that winds up with all of his friends and then I see it and the parent says, well, my kid would never do that, but it can't, it has his address, you know, their home computer address on it. Um, it's, that's, and my point being in, in all of this is, making parents understand this really is a problem and to be not only active but to be proactive on it. And I find, at least in my dealings out west, it's a little difficult to sometimes make parents understand. That's uh, very My kid wouldn't do that, you know, kind of thing. Well, uh, denial will not get you anywhere in this <laughs> particular thing and I think uh, many parents probably do want to believe their children uh, you know, wear halos over their head and they're perfect angels all the time. Uh, and again, with the, you take the vulnerability of young children. Yeah. Uh, and we know, for example, that uh, many of those who end up being trafficked in, uh, in minor uh, sex trafficking uh, are runaways. They're, they're individuals who, uh, you know, for some type of a, a circumstantial thing at home are having some difficulties and uh, they become vulnerable. Then they're uh, they're prime targets and they become prime targets to being lured and enticed by those who are going to traffic uh, that child. And so, you know, going back through all again, all the technology pieces and how that that can happen, uh, it begins again with good parental awareness and understanding, uh, you know, that, that child and what they're doing, who they're hanging with. Right, yeah. Uh, um, my favorite subject, back page. Um, can we talk about back page a little bit? Um, the most recent activities of Backpage in that they defied a subpoena in, to come in front of a, a Senate committee is mind-boggling that sure. they wouldn't show up. Not surprising though. Sure. Uh, I, I, I know that they are owned by someone else now. They were originally headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. The two men that owned it live in my neighborhood. And quite frankly, they pass themselves off as decent human beings and I find it my husband has to remind me to behave myself at home. So <laughs> anyway, um, what do we do? How do we combat uh, an or organizations like Backpage and others that are wholesale selling our children and saying, no, we check, we know they're old enough. We have a, a paper here that says they're old enough. Oh, sure. And in fact, uh, that public policy uh, debate is now ongoing, and it's a good one to have. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, Senator Heitkamp, uh, with a hearing just right. recently, right, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, which I was able to attend, was able to uh, really start focusing the spotlight on this organization Backpage and others that are out there uh, that will hide behind uh, the veil of our, of our uh, Constitution and our right to free speech to say that they can put an ad on a website uh, that, that uh, purports to show uh, an individual without maybe any attribution or, or discussion about what age that person is, uh, but clearly are trafficking and helping to traffic in minor children uh, for sex. 
And so when you boil all that down and you start to look at how that's happening, uh, the, again, the public policy debate needs to happen now. Uh, we cannot, uh, I don't think as a society, as a, as a culture, as a people, allow this to continue. If, again, going back to my example a moment ago, through ads and uh, uh, individuals being able to, to find indiv uh, young children to be able to, uh, to buy them for sexual, uh, their own sexual desires, like you would go uh, on any other type of ad to buy a car, uh, there's, there's a true distinction there that somehow in the conscience of our country we have to come to grips with. Uh, so I am very pleased to say part of that's already in motion. You know, we are, we are tackling that very, very strongly. Uh, we are making some effort right now to work with uh, Congress to find some, uh, some really good, uh, I would even call them good strong arm tactic to get this kind of stuff to stop. Because, you know, if, if you don't have um, uh, an effort and an energy and a zeal to do something, as much as like you're doing now with, with the McCain Institute, to highlight and focus on it, nothing's going to change. Uh, I, I honestly believe, and, and we all know it, right? There's nothing that will really change. So it starts with a, with a movement and an effort uh, to try to change that whole uh, uh, legal issue uh, and to get them to understand that they can't hide behind uh, the veil of just saying it's a constitutional right to be able to put it up an ad with a young child on it. Does this include the, the um, <coughs> Communications Decency Act? Is that somehow involved in this, a it, change in that or? That's true, and I, and I think they're looking at all the different particulars yeah. of how, you know, the, the, the laws and communication right now that could be used, again, for legitimate yeah. reasons, but the ones where, you know, we know that there's criminal activity. I mean, if you were putting up an ad to sell, uh, you, know, um, you know, large quantities of heroin, uh, somebody would yeah. probably, you know, pull you aside and arrest you and you'd go to jail. Uh, so similarly saying, uh, you know, you just can't say, anything goes on the World Wide Web, anything goes in an ad uh, is, is insane. That's, that is absolutely not true. Uh, so uh, th there is a line of demarcation, and I am I'm very grateful that, uh, that Congress now, and, and the, they're really taking a more passionate look at it. I think they made a, a very, on a personal note, I think they made a very serious mistake by standing Heidi Heitkamp up, Senator Heitkamp. I think she's after him now. I'm happy to say, <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> um, can you tell me uh, how, how your efforts in, in helping to combat human trafficking and uh, protect these children, save these children, has changed over the past 10 years? Yes, I, I can say that uh, right now with our partnerships with a lot of the, uh, the technology giants has helped us. Uh, it's helping us as a nation, I think. Uh, being able to find the right hashtags on pictures and being able to uh, use the strengths of uh, the technology giants to be able to partner with us so that when online uh, predators or uh, sex trafficking, those types of things that are being done through the technology means are, uh, are working now better than they were uh, 10 years ago, for example. Uh, there's a lot more education and awareness going on now. Uh, as was noted in the opening it's a perfect comments. perfect storm right now. On this yes, I, I mean, really, that's a fabulous thing in itself. Uh, you know, the old um, uh, current actually uh, saying in Homeland Security, if you see something, you know, say something. And that is true uh, now in this sit uh, situation as well. Uh, because, again, denying that there's, uh, there's not human trafficking happening or child sex trafficking happening uh, in your area. Uh, I can tell you, I, I don't drive by a truck stop anymore and think of it in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm in a shopping mall and, uh, you know, years of old where it might have been quite safe to have children there by themselves, mm -hmm. uh, whenever I see those kind of play areas where children are there, those are magnets for pedophiles and others. Uh, so, you know, you have to start to think. In ten, 10 years ago, maybe it wasn't quite as unsafe, but now... And we see plenty of examples in everyday news of young children that go missing, young children that are harmed. Sadly, some uh, they either are not found or, uh, or end up uh, uh, being found, but being found dead. Uh, so it, it breaks your heart, it's a, and it's an issue that from, said, 10 years ago or many years ago. So the National Center, we're trying to be on the forefront of all these issues. How can we raise awareness? How can we train children early? How can we get parents involved? 
You know, how can we shape public policy? Uh, how can we work with technology giants to make uh, things better for safe surfing on the, on the internet? How can we work with law enforcement to, uh, uh, to do things and to, to crack down on those who are going to be uh, trafficking children? Uh, so it's, it's a battle on literally all kinds of fronts. Well, I, it, one of the, the areas, obviously, that the McCain Institute is beginning to focus on a little bit is human trafficking outside our own borders. And uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, because I know NICMIC and, uh, and other organizations, ICMIC and all of them have been, are involved, heavily involved offshore on trying to combat some of this. Um, tell me, I guess tell me what the progress is and where you see this going. Can we do it? Can we make this a worldwide effort that's actually conceived and actually workable uh, on this? Or are we really just kind of building, building a few blocks at a time, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, it's a great question. In fact, uh, we are working very well and, uh, and making advancements all the time with our uh, international partners. We work very closely with the, uh, the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, uh, the senior officials from the German uh, Federal Police are coming to the National Center to partner and talk with us about these very issues of, of, of uh, uh, child sex trafficking and exploitation and, and all that. Uh, and we have a, a whole network through our cyber tip line of, of capabilities to be able to uh, share information, sharing reports. We're working very closely with Interpol, very closely with Europol a number of organizations internationally to focus on it as well because while the problem is is uh, quite pronounced here in the United States uh, internationally it is uh, a, a very very difficult as well and hard to keep uh, uh, certain you know controls on it there uh, primarily because many nations have um, uh, very few or very ineffective laws believe it or not when it comes to this or they're not enforced or they're not enforced so you look at it from an international perspective, uh, you're only really as effective or as good as that, that government and those policing authorities or, or authorities generally would want to combat it and help do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're always advocating and trying to work with our uh, uh, a more formidable partners such as the German police yeah. and others who come by to visit us so that we can get that message out there uh, to them. Is the, it, it just by by chance, are the German police coming in because of the refugee push that's, that's entered Germany? Is this part of the trafficking issue? Uh, I, I don't know if that's, that's strictly the issue. I, I think uh, they've been actually visited us uh, a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's more from their, their law enforcement um, uh, capabilities as it would relate to finding missing children, or particularly on the exploitation. Uh, and as it relates to a lot of the cyber child pornography and right. that type of thing is, yeah. is, is quite often what they're most interested in. Uh, I was going to comment a moment ago, too, when you mentioned about back pages to go to that for a minute. But I think ironically, uh, I, I'd find a little bit of humor in this, but I think if, it's, if there's a contempt of court uh, issue, uh, uh, order issued, that the U.S. Marshals would be the ones to go... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Go get this guy. So I, um, <laughs> I want to ride along. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go on that uh, that expedition. Um, uh, tell me what what uh, you are seeing, and if you can comment from not just a national level but a worldwide issue, um, the misconceptions that people and governments and countries have about child trafficking, particularly child hum human trafficking. Yeah, in some cases, uh, there's a blind eye to it. They want to make believe it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's true even in some places in America here. I think we, we can say, because we don't see it and it's not necessarily noticeable, we can think that it's not as prevalent or as pronounced as it is. So one thing is, uh, you know, just that whole awareness of making sure people understand that it is, a, and this is one of the great things your institute is doing, is raising that level uh, of, of awareness. So, you know, as we think about going forward, you think about, you know, how can we take uh, the message of this particular issue uh, into the communities, into homes, and have people understand uh, the size and complexity of it? And that's on a worldwide message, which mm -hmm. makes it a little bit more difficult. Yet we're, we're trying to use those platforms that we can to be a voice. So one of the, one of the uh, challenges and certain goals that I have is to be 
uh, have our center be the voice and be the advocate for uh, those who are being exploited. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of us need a voice and an advocate, a cheerleader, somebody who cares, somebody who's going to do something about it. And uh, so I have the um, uh, sort of the honor and distinction on one hand of being at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. But some days I can say if there's anything that does take the wind out of my sails or depress me a little bit, it's the scope and magnitude about what we see. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen instances, for example, where uh, the image of a, of a child can be um, uh, put online, an ad can be put online, and instantaneously, within milliseconds, uh, the, the, the picture starts being uh, distribu distrib distributed, uh, as well as, uh, as, in the case of Backpage or putting up ads, the moment an ad goes up, uh, the phone starts ringing. So the size and complexity is sort of a goal of mine mm -hmm. is to try to uh, keep this awareness and keep this pressure, keep this focus on it so that we can do something about it. Good. Um, uh, I went in, I do, I do this on a yearly basis. I go in and talk to the editorial board of the Arizona Republic. Uh, not a large newspaper by, in, by any stretch, but you know we're a decent-sized community. And I always rather thought that we were somewhat progressive, you know, that we had our, at least had our eye on things and, and you know, did a few things, you know, at least knew what was going on. And the same, I pose this question every year when I go in so they know it's coming. Um, I said, because when I grew up, I was born and raised in Arizona. I, when I, growing up there, when a person was arrested for soliciting prostitution or something like that, their picture was automatically put in the newspaper. And I remembered as a child, because my, you know, my mom would say, you know, these guys are really bad and this is what's going on. That's, they don't do that anymore. So my question to them was, why don't you, pub growing up, you all used to publish the news pictures in the newspaper. And I kid you not, the publisher of the newspaper, and I have a witness here that was with me both times when I asked the question, said, oh, they might get hurt. Their families might hurt these men. And I said, as opposed to them hurting a child. I mean, and so it, I thought we'd made great progress in Arizona, and we just took two steps forward in that conversation, or two steps backwards in that conversation. How do we change the conception of the customer that these guys, it's not boys will be boys. Right. Uh, you know, the whole idea that, that somehow this is okay, you know. Sure, sure. Uh, shame or humiliation probably is, a, is, a, is not necessarily a bad tool. I mean, I if agree. you think about uh, <laughs> uh, the whole issue of, uh, of what's being done in those situations with minor children, uh, and I guess it, it would then boil down to what does uh, a particular uh, uh, journalism or, or venue have a stomach for, what they would do to actually publish mm -hmm. or... Uh, explain or show the the more dark side uh, or or who these actual actors are or who these uh, individuals who are uh, procuring and buying uh, minor children for sale mm -hmm. who are they and so putting their picture yeah. out may not uh, necessarily be a bad idea so. clearly someone disagrees <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I think it's time to take questions. Is this? Am I correct on this? <laughs> I, th I saw someone wave a thing. Am I right? Is it time for questions? Okay, I'm sorry. I can't see the cards very well. So uh, we do have people out there with microphones. Can we? Anyone? If you'd like to ask our guest a question, please do or me. But, uh, over here. There's one here. Give it a few. Please introduce yourself. Ken Myrick. Um, who is the most prominent person in terms of public power who has ever been caught in child sex trafficking? Wow. Um, <laughs> Alphabetically uh, or in order of importance? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I don't have any names at the top of my head. Of course, in my... In, in my, um, in my three months at the center, uh, I have not had the, I guess, the, uh, the research yet to actually look at, you know, who, who I could name and say is the most prominent person. 
Uh, I, I would suppose if you were to uh, go in any particular jurisdiction and, and uh, impose that question just uh, online, you'd probably find major cases, major offenses. U.S. Attorney's offices, of course, make press releases on these types of things uh, that would indicate who some of the more uh, uh, visible or prominent uh, individuals are. But uh, I, I just can't think of somebody off the top of my head, regretfully. That's what, that's what the... Uh, 28 years in the federal government did to me. It. You know, in my opinion, uh, it's not necessarily a person, although I'll name one, but it's the country of Nigeria right now. Um, the former president, good luck, Jonathan, simply let Boko Haram run with those kids. And he's, we know the kids have been distributed all over the world now. And he didn't do anything. He never stopped him, never fought him, never did anything. So I find him one of the most contemptuous people I've ever read about, I, I don't know him or anything, but I, ha, and, and the, the inability for the rest of the world to even say something. I mean, we all held up signs that said, bring back our girls, but nobody, nobody stopped this guy. Nobody said, go find him, fend for your country here. That's a good point. Uh, so anyway, that to me was outrageous. It's not, maybe not a good answer to your question, but uh, another question, anyone? There's one here. Yes, ma'am. Come here. Um, I first got interested in this issue when I did a paper on it, and I, I mean, I was like over 50 years old. I had no idea the horrors some of these girls go through, and guys too, and uh, the seasoning, the tattooing, the things like this. Um, and I wondered if, um, kind of along your idea about the pictures, but if even preemptively people could be made aware, because I don't think most people know of the total horror of what's done to some of these girls, especially the ones who maybe aren't the prettiest. Um, and the second thing is, um, and, and I heard you talk yesterday on the, um, at the, you know, Congress, mm -hmm. and uh, when you spoke about the customers and um, also about raising awareness, and with the Police, um, do they have enough awareness? Because my experience is like, if a child's a runaway, they kind of like wait to 18 hours and figure they had a fight with their family and stuff like this. And in the meanwhile, terrible things could happen to them. So could you address those two things? Sure. Uh, well, for example, we are doing a lot of training with law enforcement right now to recognize uh, signs or uh, particular uh, things about um, what they might see if they go into a home, for example, or if they're on a traffic stop and they see uh, certain things in a car, a, a child, minor child in the back seat, uh, certain things that the driver uh, may be doing that could indicate that that's not necessarily a, a friend of, the, of that child or parent uh, or, or somebody in a proper custodial situation. So we're training a lot of law enforcement to become more aware. Uh, in fact, at our center, we have uh, uh, hundreds of officers every year, uh, law enforcement going through to be trained in uh, how to be more sort of aware of the kinds of things that you're, uh, you're pointing out. Um, you know, some of the other uh, sort of public policy issues that we're trying to look at is it, uh, from the center as it relates to uh, highlighting this. We know a uh, young child, they're groomed. Uh, they, they are uh, taken at particularly points of high vulnerability. That's why there's a, a few years ago, for example, it's about one out of every six runaways had ended up in some type of sex trafficking situation. In more recent times, it's one out of every five. So it's, you know, it's starting to uh, become a, a more prominent, more pronounced uh, situation. But uh, all of that begins through this whole process of taking those who are vulnerable. And as it was pointed out earlier, to, to note that they're not uh, uh, child prostitutes. This is their their true victims. They're, these aren't willing participants in this process. If, if I can say also, there's something that we're testing, and I think we're I think it's going to be implemented in a few more schools in Arizona. But it's working with elementary and high school boys, talking about respect, respecting little girls, respecting women, respecting, and I don't often think, particularly the at-risk communities, are not not getting that kind of message from from home if they if they're even in home uh, at all. So beginning with the basics that it is not okay to hit or hurt or abuse a little girl or a little boy, but 
just the basic concept of respect. Um, and that's something that we as a community felt that was very important to try to instill in our children at a very young age. Um, it's a message you think we get at home, but that doesn't happen all the time. Um, and one more question. There, right there. Um, hi, my name is Blake Osborne. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, my city has one of the unfortunate distinctions of being one of the largest uh, hubs unfortunately, and I read a report once that part of the difficulty in this issue is the inequality due to the law in the sense that law enforcement is trained to look for prostitution and it's easier to arrest people for prostitution than to arrest, for lack of a better term, the Johns themselves. So I was wondering, is there any action you know of or going on in Congress to combat that? Uh, I, I don't know that there's uh, uh, current uh, activities within Congress to combat that. I think a lot of uh, the local jurisdictions and some of the state jurisdictions have been taking a, a look at that. Um, and, and probably if you went state by state and looked at some of the uh, laws and the way they're structuring now about more identifying uh, who are those individuals who are purchasing, going out to buy, uh, to look and seek uh, the minor children for sex, uh, uh, that, that, that those laws are probably stronger. Um, but I, I'm not aware on the federal level what efforts might be done to, to increase that. The, there's a, a, a number of NGOs, as you know, that are working on just that. It's, again, beginning with the basics. Uh, it's about changing the language. Uh, from prostitute to victim. It's about enabling communities, and so, such a, as what we've done, but other states have done in a beautiful way as well, in offering services so that that child, when picked up, uh, you know, in the situation that they're in, does not wind up in jail, but winds up someplace safe where services can be offered and where they can, can seek treatment as well. Um, it, it's, so, it's such a spider web of problems and issues, but it begins with a change of language and a change of understanding. And we, you know, we have a very rural community out west and, you know, the, most of our law enforcement looked at these little girls as being prostitutes. You know, oh, they want it. They're there because they, you know, it's fine. We gotta have that. And that's not what this is. And so what we've been trying to do is really deeply change the whole attitude and educate them, make it part of their police process and their training process in both the academy and then ongoing training. It's a long process, though, and, but it does begin with the very basics. And you have some good stuff going on, though. Delta Airlines, by the way, is outstanding on this issue. They're just, in my opinion. We have, yes. I'm sorry to talk too much, but uh, they're amazing. <laughs> they really are. Um, oh, I, can we take one more? OK. One, yes, ma'am, right there, red jacket. Sorry about that. Hello, I was wondering, you, it was earlier mentioned the fact that once upon a time, domestic violence was not considered domestic violence. And that was a change in definition. So earlier you mentioned that the number has, of, I believe it was children being trafficked has gone from one in six to one in five. Do you think that is partially due to the change in definition of what is considered human trafficking and sex trafficking? Or do you think it has more to do with the actual increase in those being trafficked? Uh, it's probably a combination of the two, I would say. Uh, sadly, I think there's an increase in the number of those being trafficked. Uh, but because of awareness uh, and the fact that we are now uh, coming to, I think, stronger grips with this problem, uh, identifying it as a problem, uh, exposing it, uh, talking about it, debating it, and having forums like this, uh, I, I think that there's a, that awareness is making it um, uh, maybe, maybe changing a definition of sorts, but bringing uh, the public into the, uh, the whole discussion uh, to understand it at its true depth and meaning. So, uh, so that, that is, uh, I, I think, part of what's going on. Well, I was just given this sign. I know what that means <laughs> over here. Um, I certainly want to thank you for coming and being a part of this. Uh, one last thing, if you wouldn't mind telling uh, our audience, how can they get involved? If they're not already involved, how can they get involved? 
Sure. Uh, we've got some great resources at the center. Um, you know, if you go to missingkids.org and you look on there, you've got youngsters that want to learn about how to safe, safely surf the web. We have NetSmarts, and that's the program that's out in all the schools. Uh, you know, we've got a, a lot of um, uh, resources at our disposal that we can help you with. We've got family advocacy uh, group that will help uh, those who are rescued and found to be victims. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of resources that we can certainly give to you. Uh, stay involved, stay aware, uh, talk to your, uh, your circle of friends about this issue. Uh, make sure that they know, you know what, what it is and that it is real, it's not just imagined, and, and get them involved in this whole movement. As I said when I started, I, I love to be in a room full of fighters, and you're obviously here because you want to hear about this topic, and you, I, I believe you want to do something about it. So spread that, uh, talk to others, and, and we can uh, collectively, collaboratively do something about it because single-handedly, it's a, it's a mountain to try to overcome. Thank you so much. And uh, we, I hope that you'll come back and join us another time. Love to. And again, again thank you discussion. for the, the great honor of being here. And, uh, and I say an open invitation. My staff might beat me for this, but uh, <laughs> if you ever are in Old Town Alexandria and you want to stop in and just look around or ask some questions, we'd love to have uh, individuals come by and know more about us. We are a nonprofit. Uh, I always say that, too, I'm making sure you know that, uh, you know, we... We do rely on donations as well, so if you find it in your heart or know people, I, I always make a public uh, pitch for that as well, just because we are a nonprofit. So. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a break. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, please join me in thanking Cindy McCain as well. This is exactly the sort of public awareness raising and conversation series that she has led across the country, really, city after city, and I think it has really made a tremendous difference in uh, public understanding of this issue. Uh, what we're going to do now, I'm going to introduce someone who's going to say a few words about the artwork outside. We're going to take a break for 15 minutes. We're going to reconvene here promptly at 3 o'clock. Uh, so if I could ask to come to the uh, stage here, uh, Kay Chernush, uh, photographic artist whose materials you'll see outside. Thank you, and it's a great honor to be included in this wonderful gathering. I thank you very much. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do is in parallel with uh, what the McCain Institute is doing, trying to raise awareness uh, of trafficking and to inspire people, everybody, to do whatever it is they do best to make a difference and to, so that we can end this practice. I, what I do best is photography. I'm a photographer and I came across this issue on an assignment for the State Department back in uh, 2005 for the TIP report and I have been gripped by this ever since. It's taken over my life, and um, I changed how I photographed people rather than doing um, street photography and documentary photography. I wanted to find a more dignifying way, which t takes the individual out of the picture, but says something more about what human trafficking is all about. From, I wanted to give a picture from the inside out. So the pictures you will see outside, those are all photographs. They're part of a longer series called Bought and Sold, Voices of Human Trafficking. Um, you won't see pictures of individuals, but you will read their stories. I sat with all of those people. I heard their stories. I photographed them for themselves. I wanted them to see themselves as beautiful and worthy. But what they told me was what, um, what cr I used that as the starting point for the images. So then I decided that work was exhibited in that, and then I decided that we could bring in other forms of artistic expression, film, dance, theater. Um, art has the power to transform attitudes, to transform how we see this issue. And so you may be asking yourselves, what does art have to do with it? We try to um, use art to really engage people, to open an empathic space 
where everybody is inspired to use their own creative talents to um, address this issue. We need all hands on deck with this very complex and pervasive um, human tragedy and human rights atrocity. So I encourage you all to come to artworksforfreedom.org, uh, check out our website, check out the wonderful coalition of artist activists that we have who are providing different entry points into this really dark subject. And I'd be happy to take questions. Um, uh, we'll be outside. I encourage you to look at the work. We want the art to shake up how you think, to think about it in new ways, and remembering that imagination is, for me, our one renewable resource. Use your imaginations, think outside the box, use your own talents in whatever field, and just contribute one thing. That's all you need to do. We don't need to do everything, but everybody needs to contribute something. So thank you, and I encourage you to look at the work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Coffee and water are over here. Bathrooms are down the hall that way. The artwork is outside, 3 o'clock.
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to uh, come back to the uh, main part of the room here to take your seats, we'll get started in just a minute. So if you could wrap up the wonderful side conversations, we'll get on with our program. Thank you.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, if we could uh, get ready to begin here. Uh, to um, kick off the second half of our program, um, we're going to have a further panel discussion focusing on victims and the importance of victims' voices in educating us and helping us to figure out what to do to stop this problem for good. In order to introduce that panel and to share uh, a bit of her own background and experiences over the last decade, I guess, um, is Corinne uh, detmeyer Vermeulen, uh, who is the Dutch National Coordinator for Trafficking in Human Beings. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Madam detmeyer Vermeulen. Thank you very much. And um, I'm honored to be at this meeting, and I want to thank the McCain Institute to invite me. I'm very sorry that I have to correct the introduction a little bit uh, because I'm not the coordinator, I'm the rapporteur. And it's not just human trafficking, but it's also sexual violence against children. And why is that important for me to correct? As a rapporteur, I'm independent. I do not have any operational duties, uh, but I tell the government uh, what they're doing wrong. And not just the government, but the police, the judiciary. I also tell them what they're doing right. And sometimes it helps them more to lure them into doing it better, to put it that way. But the fact that I am independent makes it possible for me to do that. Um, this morning, Mrs. McCain told about her own um, uh, experience uh, in a shop in India where she saw, as she later deducted from that, a case of human trafficking and where she walked away. Um, and I think many of us have a story like that. I have one like that. I used to have a cleaning lady about 20 years ago who came from Sri Lanka, and she, her name was Pushba, and she'd worked for me for about a year. She had to go back to her country because her mother had gotten ill. Um, and so I didn't hear anything from her. I didn't really expect that, but, you know. And then at one time, there was a little note in my, um, in, in, in my mailbox, and it was from Pushpa, and she said she was back in the Netherlands, and the only way she could do that was come with a, um, a diplomatic, a Greek diplomatic family, and that she was maltreated, didn't get any money, um, uh, had to work all hours of the day. And I read this letter, and I didn't really know what to do. And uh, at that time, this was not a punishable crime. It was before the Palermo Protocol. It was before, before human trafficking. But nevertheless, it was a cry for help. And I did nothing. Um, and now we would say it's human trafficking. And I am a little ashamed. No, not a little. I am ashamed for not doing anything at that time. And I think that many of us will have, if they think back, um, and know more about human trafficking, as I do now, will know also those instances. And, and I hope that the next time something like that happens, you, you will react. I've been the Dutch Rapporteur on trafficking for nearly 10 years now, monitoring, collecting data, and reporting on the nature and scale of human trafficking in the Netherlands. And during this period, I've seen a shift in our perception of the crime and consequently in our efforts to fight it. And I would like to share some of my experiences with you using the concept of framing. We've talked about seeing and looking, and this is just another word for basically the same way of dealing with this phenomena. For more than 15 years, we have, as a global community, witnessed the impact of the United Nations Palermo Protocol that has had for a more widespread understanding of what trafficking in human beings encompasses. Worldwide, the protocol has opened people's eyes to the comprehensiveness of the phenomenon. And multiple regional and national documents, such as your Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, have continued the development and further elaborated upon the question of how to compose the most effective approach to human trafficking. 
And in the years after the drafting of the protocol, the com comprehensive interpretation of human trafficking has acquired a greater definition. Um, in the EU directive, for instance, on human trafficking, new forms of exploitation are specifically listed, such as exploitation in criminal activities and forced begging. Previously, these forms of exploitation were not connected with human trafficking. And this brings me to the concept of framing. Framing is about looking at, ex at an existing phenomenon in a different way. Reframing with the aim to see the problem for what it truly is, because only then change is possible. And let me illustrate why framing is of essential significance when it comes to taking the right measures. Um, one is a in the Dutch practice. Um, we've talked about this uh, earlier, about the domestic sex trafficking. Um, and it's about, uh, it, it led to reframing a long existing irregular uh, situations of domestic sex tra trafficking that we refer to as the lover boy phenomenon, which is a nice word for really a terrible situation. It's an awful term. A Dutch journalist introduced this term in 1998, and the term was coined for boys who lead mostly underage Dutch girls into prostitution by means of romantic relationship. And these girls were mainly associated with problems in relation to puberty, running away from home, and truancy. And as a result, the tendency was to label these girls as problem cases, as one uh, shelter said, we know how to deal with girls with lover boy problems. And when I read that, I, I was uh, flabbergasted because it's not them, it's not that they have these problems. Because what they were seen was as if they are at fault. And sadly enough, the label of lover boys has been um, uh, copied in the, in the UK, in Belgium and Germany. In the United States, the term Romeo pimps is used. And the use of these terms, terms which have no basis in policy nor law, obscures the approach to combat this problem. An effective approach starts with seeing the phenomenon for what it truly is, human trafficking, and ex as exploitation of girls, but also boys, as girls and boys who fall victim of this uh, atrocious act, an act which must be fought from a human trafficking perspective, using all possible means that this uh, criminal law gives us. Over the last years, I repeatedly urged the Dutch government to reframe this phenomenon to human trafficking, lose the word lover boys. And I must admit, that I still use it myself now and then because it's such a well-known word and everybody knows what you mean. Since we have uh, um, counted trafficking victims in the year 2000, the number of victims of so-called lover boys has remained stable at a quarter of the total number of victims of trafficking. In other words, the number of domestic victims did not diminish, and they should have. If there is one place where, one area where prevention should have a, a, a sizable effect, it is in domestic trafficking because it's girls and boys, victims and perpetrators who go to our schools and who we should try and be able to reach. And as a former juvenile judge, this never ceases to infuriate me that we can't really get this number down. Recently, however, my recommendations to fight this phenomena from the human uh, trafficking perspective was adopted and, and successful. The police and public prosecutors prioritize prosecuting this group of traffickers with uh, underage victims. Uh, specific prevention programs are being created and protection for these victims has been put in place. Reframing revealed to be the first step in an effective approach to combat this phenomenon. This morning, um, there were two words uh, on this subject that stood out for me. Prostitution and demand. 
And I completely agree. When we talk about children or men buying sex or women buying sex from underage uh, or minors, um, the word prostitution is just the wrong word to use. We don't want that word. There's no such, such thing as child prostitution. And the other one was demand. Um, and um, uh, when in the Netherlands the ban on brothels was lifted in the year 2000, a criminal act was added to our criminal code uh, criminalizing buying sex from minors, 16 and 17 year olds. And of course, under the age of 16, it's always a sexual assault. And um, last, about a year ago, there was a huge case in Valkenburg, a small city in the south of the Netherlands, where a 16-year-old had um, been manipulated to sell sex to um, many men. There was talk about 100. But a basket full of uh, used condoms was found and a telephone with a lot of telephone numbers was found. So the customers of these, um, of these, of this girl, could be found, and they were. And in the beginning, the media saw this as something. Hmm, these men were just going to a prostitute, and well, they had bad luck that she happened to be 16. I was really, really angry. Uh, about this tone of voice, and I vented my anger. Um, and, um, and then two of these men committed suicide. And of course, this, this is tragic for their families, but it shows that um, people are very ashamed of doing this and, and shaming them and letting them know that they will be found and will be prosecuted and punished is, I think, a very good preventative um, measure. So I looked at all the cases from the year, year 2000 that had been before the court on buying sex from 16 and 17 year olds. And I saw about 180 convictions. Half of those were after 2015, which means also that our law enforcement is really taking this seriously. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the, um, well, the reframing and also uh, with the shift the media made and is now uh, also seeing this as the sexual crime that it is. More than ever, we need to use the human trafficking frame to gain better insight in already existing phenomena. Reframing is not a goal in itself, it is a means whereby we can see these problems for what they really are, and only then real change is possible. But to achieve a relevant improvement, training and raising awareness, awareness are key elements as well. I too, Mrs. McCain, speak for Rotary and Lion Clubs. And because I have two mandates, I sometimes ask them which subject they want, human trafficking or sexual violence against children. And they, nearly all of them choose human trafficking because they think that is somewhere way out there, whereas sexual violence against children is very close. And nowadays I sometimes say, I will only come if I can speak about my uh, second mandate, because that too is something that needs to be, um, that people need to be more aware of. And one of the things that I see having the, both these mandates is that there's so much um, going from the one problem into the other. Uh, many of the girls who are a victim of human trafficking, sex trafficking, have been sexually abused when they were younger. Um, the international region, regional documents they, uh, on human trafficking contain a substantive obligation to train personnel in this field and call upon all organizations that may come into contact with possible victims to ensure that this is done. And this, in fact, entails everyone and everybody. 
The juvenile judge, with no training on trafficking issues, must be able to recognize when and if a young shoplifter was made to steal. The Child Protection Agency must learn to discern the underlying reasons for truancy. Local government has to step up and play its part, and public-private cooperation is needed in the fight against trafficking. I have elaborated on this one example uh, of looking at long existing situations from a new perspective, with new eyes, so to speak. I could give you more, but my time is up, and uh, I'm sure that the message is clear. As the American writer Wayne Dyer once said, change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. An effective approach largely depends on our capacity to change the way we look. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to ask our second panel now to come to the stage. Um, please uh, come on up. We have uh, Tina Front, the founder of Courtney's House. We have Carolyn Jones, who is a resident advocate of Streetlight USA. Anne Wilkinson director of mentor services, My Life is Choice, and our moderator to open up, say a few words, and get the conversation going is Kara Vandekar, executive director of Eden House. So thank you, Kara. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, Mrs. McCain and McCain Institute for um, putting on this valuable symposium. And as we all know, um, one of the first steps in fighting a problem is understanding the problem and understanding that you have a problem. And that's why these kinds of symposiums are so valuable. So thank you. And thank you to these lovely ladies that I get to introduce, Anne and Carolyn and Tina. Um, I'm very honored to be here on stage with these ladies and be able to introduce them. My name is Cara Vandekar, and I am the um, co-founder and executive, I was the executive director, now president of the board of Eden House. And I was asked to come and um, introduce these lovely ladies because after starting a home for survivors, a residence for two years, I understand the value in survivor leadership in a very real way. Um, Eden House is a two-year residential program in New Orleans, Louisiana that started out of my work um, writing the Trafficking in Persons Report for the State Department in the country of Jamaica and my work as an attorney changing the laws in Louisiana and realizing we can have great laws, we can have these amazing reports. If we have nowhere for survivors to go to recover, we have nothing. So my co-founder and I started Eden House. It's a two-year residential program. We offer our residents free of charge housing, food, medical care, psychiatric care, job training, education, dental services, all of the support they need and the resources they need to take their lives back and to recover and to do it on their own because no one can do it for you. And one of the most um, interesting things that I've really seen um, and been inspired by is the power of the human spirit, which is absolutely incredible when you hear um, survivor stories. And the other thing that um, is weird for me to say as an attorney and a former diplomat is actually the principle upon which Eden House is founded. It's a, um, a model that we've used called the Magdalen House model out of Nashville, Tennessee. It is founded on the principle that love is the strongest force for change in the universe. And only through loving and respecting each of our women when they come through the door, recognizing their intrinsic beauty, can we then, through that love, give them the resources they need to heal themselves. And um, I was thinking about Mr. Clark's remarks that we're, I'm in a room full of fighters. We're all in a room full of fighters. Um, but you know, I want to challenge all of, all of you fighters, because I'm, I'm one of them, that maybe the way, the way to win this fight is through love. And maybe that's the only way to win this fight, is to recognize the intrinsic beauty 
of all of our survivors, of everyone victimized by this type of crime. And through the respect and recognition and love of that intrinsic beauty, can we give other people the strength that they need to fight their own fight? And the power of that love I have seen most poignantly through the love that survivors give to other survivors. It is incredibly different mm -hmm. when one survivor oh, yeah. who's in an amazing place and in recovery yeah. can reach her hand back yeah. and look into the eyes mm -hmm. of another survivor and say to her, I've been there. Mm -hmm. I know where you are. I know where you've been. But I did it. And so can you. Mm -hmm. And that is the love and the power of these women here. And that is why this is really the heart of recovery, is empowering women like these three amazing women here mm -hmm. to do the work that only they can do. And so I want to um, recognize and congratulate each of them for everything they've done to be here because no one can imagine or even grasp the stories and, and how much people can survive and still be able to, through the power of the human spirit, stand up and help others and be a part of that recovery for so many more is really um, incredible. And I wanna let each of these ladies um, say a little bit about what they do. Tina, we're gonna put you on the hot seat. <laughs> Tina Front is the founder of Courtney's House, and I'm gonna give her a few minutes um, to say a little bit about what she does. Okay, hello everyone. Hi. So I'm very interactive, so I'm trying to fight the urge to put everyone in a circle yeah. and we can talk about <laughs> our feelings <laughs> and what all about trafficking. Mm -hmm. So my name is Tina Friend and I'm the founder of Courtney's House. Courtney's House is based here in Washington, D.C. It's a drop-in center and we provide long-term services for both males and females, ages 11 to 21. 21 means you enter in at 21, doesn't mean an exit. We also have support groups. Every other Saturday we focus on transitioning your mindset out of the life. We also have parent support groups because 40% 40% of our referrals come from parents. And I think it's really important because for some odd reason, there's this message that no one has a family and no one has anyone looking for them. And that's not a true statement at all. So I think that's interesting. We do street outreach on the street from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. in high trafficking areas. So I want you to think about that for a moment and then I will tell you that we do street outreach four and a half blocks away from here. Mm -hmm. So we also focus on D.C., Maryland, Virginia. So one of the malls we do outreach in is this Tyson's Corner. For mm. So just kind of giving you an idea of expanding your mind on trafficking. So that's what Courtney's House does, long-term services, um, both male and female. So I want us to know that, of course, boys are trafficked as well and the LGBT population. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, Carolyn Jean Jones, and now Carolyn, you get to be on the hot seat. <laughs> Carolyn is with us um, from um, Streetlight USA out of Phoenix, Arizona. And um, I'd love it, Carolyn, if you'd tell us a little bit about what you do um, in Arizona through Streetlight. Hi, my name is Carolyn Jones, and I work with an organization called Streetlight USA. And what we do at Streetlight is we house the young victims that are officers fine or they sometimes they come through CPS um, private placements we actually house the girls we take girls from 11 to um, 18 we can um, we can house them until they're 25 if they're in school um, these girls come to us they go to school there a lot of them do not even realize that they're victims and it do take a long time for them to even recognize that they're being victimized because they look at it like, I'm not a victim, I'm not, that's a weak word. They look at victim as a weak word. Um, I also do a group with them um, called Let's Rap. And in this group, I hear some of everything. They are allowed to talk their language, the way they talk. They're allowed to tell their truth the way, according to them. Mm -hmm. I 
sit with them, and this, some, it's, and so in sitting with them, you will hear a lot of their pain through allowing them to speak. And so they go to school there. They have art class there. They um, they go on, they um, they go visits with their family. We have family counseling. I counsel with them, and I work with um, organizations that works with these young girls. Thank you. And now I want to introduce Ann Wilkinson. Um, Anne is the Director of Mentoring Services at My Life, My Choice. And um, we had a great conversation earlier about um, what those services look like and why those services are, are so powerful and so important. Hi, everybody. My name is Anne Wilkinson, as you heard. First, I want to thank the McCain Institute for their work and the, the great effort that they put together to address this issue. Uh, we were supposed to be here last month, and the snow kept us from coming. <laughs> yes. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, and thank you guys so much for your, your services. Um, My Life, My Choice was started in 2011. It was started as a result of a young girl being found dead. Um, it was later discovered that she had been murdered that she had run away from home, and that she had been exploited by a pimp. Um, and so we, we still don't know what happened to her, but My Life, My Choice was born out of that. Um, I have the pleasure of directing the mentoring program. However, we have three parts to My Life, My Choice. We train across the United States. Um, we train law enforcement, social services, anybody who wants to know about CSEC, the commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, we also have a 10-week curriculum that are, we run in schools and group homes and DYS and social service agencies that educate youth, and that's our prevention model to educate young girls. We work with girls, boys, and transgender youth, but the majority of our work we started was with girls um, because that's a major population that is being exploited. Um, and lastly, my favorite and the best <laughs> part of what we do is we have a one-to-one -one mentoring program. Survivors are paired with youth who are at risk of being exploited or have been exploited, and they get to have one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with a mentor. Our girls are uh, under 18. However, a mentor will not leave her uh, at all, so they're with her forever. So that's like the best part of what we do, and I get to direct that program, I supervise the mentors, which are all survivors. Our work is kind of unique in that all of our mentors are survivors of exploitation, um, and that uh, it's very effective. We found it's most, most effective. So that's kind of a little bit of what we do. I don't want to talk too much, because then I'll answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I have a couple of questions for you ladies, um, but I'm happy to have it as a dialogue too. Um, Tina, the first question is actually for you, and I know you've been on the front lines um, fighting human trafficking for a long time now. We're not going to name the years. <laughs> we're not going to say how many years. <laughs> All of us young ladies, we're not going to just say, but it's been a while, and um, so you've had a lot of experience and um, have seen the changes that have been made um, about the dialogue about human trafficking. And I'm wondering, what do you think some of the progress is, and what are the challenges that we still have where we haven't made as much progress as we need to make? Well, um, so I've, wow, I was in the, this movement from the very beginning, since 2003. So I think I saw a lot of change, um, some policy change as well. There are more events and more training around the country. There is more awareness of human trafficking. Um, I found that to be a change. There are more people wanting to do housing and services, so I think that's good. There are more expansion of different types of services, which I also think is good, and more police wanting to do something. Now, on the other side of that, um, we're still a young movement. So I, I think people need to understand that. This is a very young movement still. Yeah. We are nowhere near sexual assault and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So we're still in that beginning phase of where do we fit survivors in? Right. Mm -hmm. And where do we put them? Do we use them as a story? Do we use them to help mm -hmm. us run our organizations? Or do we have leadership roles? So I, I think that's kind of where we are where we are still, as survivors, um, kind of still trying to get paid the same and still trying to get um, recognition on that. So we do a lot of work, but actually survivors are the lowest paid in the movement. 
even speaking fees are $100 and $200 to tell our life story. So I think that it's great that we're getting more awareness, but I do think that it's also awareness of how to treat survivors in the movement. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I actually think that's happening because I'm on the federal side. And on the federal side, we're having a lot of conversations and even trying to see what we can do on the policy level of that. I'm meaning consistency in training. I think it's some amazing training out here. I think it's no consistency. So sometimes people learn a different way of trafficking and very different when a survivor does it. Yes. And they can kind of, it's very different. So that means one isn't better than the other. It means that we must collaborate those two together in a fair way that we would do with any contract incorporation and include survivors in a fair way. Just like in domestic violence and sexual assault, we had to and make sure that they are always a constant voice because this movement started off of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <yay>. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So Courtney's house is now eight years old, and you've had a lot of um, survivors come through your doors yes. and start a new um, path of healing. What are um, the tools needed for that healing process, and what do you think are the most important aspects of that healing process? I think that's a really good question to ask about what the tools are mm -hmm. that you need. I think people ask that a lot. So my number one tool that I think you need is a true understanding of each form of sex trafficking, right? Mm -hmm. Because you actually can't provide services if you don't fully understand that. Mm -hmm. And I mean that there are four paradigms for trafficking. Right. So pimp control, gang control, family, and boys. So to help the, the, the population you serve, right, we actually have to have a full understanding first. And if we're working with boys, and also girls, then we have to have a full standing of what the LGBT is and what trafficking mm -hmm. actually looks like. That's one. The next piece to that is that understanding that survivors of sex trafficking are people, right? Because people are different. And because people are different, it would be awesome that if we can just have this big blanket mm -hmm. and put everybody under the blanket and everyone's healed the same right. exact way, that would be great. It's just that it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So services should be long-term. If we're doing housing, which yeah. is amazing to just throw up all this housing, that's great. Here's the problem with that. People are not gonna live in your housing forever. Mm -hmm. So what type of other services, because housing is great, it's just that trauma's not fixed in a year and two years. Right. So what are the longer term? What are services are we doing for the boys? So for me, mm -hmm. it's just that serving the population. So at Courtney's house to answer that, what are we doing differently? For me, we do use the Harriet Tubman model. Harriet Tubman was a slave. Not only was she a slave, she freed herself from slavery, went back, risked her life, mm -hmm. and helped free others. Here's the thing about that. She did not say that she only would help slaves that were female. Right. She did not say that she would only help slaves that are over the age of 18. What she did was say that I will help everyone that is in slavery. Mm -hmm. So if we are going to help this population, our population, mine, this is who I am, then we must embed ourselves into the services, understand that, and not put these stipulations. Stipulations are put into place because of funding. Right. Mm -hmm. But after 18, where would I go then? So that's what I think the services <laughs> need to be. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Nice well, and I think that you touched upon something that, um, that we've seen kind of as a dialogue, and I think um, the senator earlier touched upon it, which is, um, once you become 18, um, and the dialogue then changes, but everybody was a child once, and because you didn't get help when you were a child and, and in trafficking, um, but now you're 18 and all of a sudden, presto, you know, all, everything should be solved. I think that you-, you I'd just like to that. add to that though, but that's, see, that's on the US citizen side. So the average age for someone on the foreign national side that is getting out of a trafficking situation is 23. That's the average age. And so you're still able to get um, everything that you need, help and to bring your family over. But for some reason, when we're talking about US citizens, we keep stopping at 18. Mm -hmm. So my trafficking situation stopped in my late 20s. Mm -hmm. It's not my fault that society did not find me, did would not, not give you. me help. Yeah. So that's what I think the framework, we have to stop that framework of one trauma is better than the other. It's not all trauma is bad. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What goals 
do the United States Advisory Council on Human Trafficking have for anti-human trafficking efforts within the United States? So I was recently uh, appointed by President Obama to the White House Advisory Board on Sex Trafficking. We're all survivors on human trafficking, and we're all survivors, which I think is amazing, both foreign national, U.S. domestic servitude. It's really good. With that being said, um, on April 16th at the SPOG meeting, we will be announcing our strategic plan, what policy to take on that we're going to be dedicating to take on for the next two years for trafficking. My passions are um, the demand, ending demand yeah. is a humongous passion. And I, and I really need you all to understand why, right? We talk about that a lot, but I'm gonna take you real bit quick to something very different for you. The demand fuels this. Without supply, there is no demand. And we can say that maybe men who buy sex, they don't know. They have no idea, it's tricked upon them. But the nightmares that I had and our survivors had and people who still try to solicit me and I'm grown and been out the life for years, <laughs> that is what continues mm -hmm. to fool it. So demand, but also I grew up in the foster care system. So growing up in a foster care system, we still need stronger laws inside of foster care. Identifying, but not just teenagers. We have to identify children who are trafficked and it looks like child abuse, but we're not asking the right questions. And then our other passion is safe harbor laws. Mm -hmm. So the safe harbor law are laws that protect children who are, are trafficked. So on a federal level, I would like to include age 21. If you're in a foster care, you actually get committed sometimes. All of our survivors are actually committed to their 21 because of mental mm -hmm. health. Well, if you are committed and it's the state actually who has legal custody, why are we charging them, right, for being sex trafficked because they're 18, but they're in a foster care, so they can't even have legal custody over themselves. So that's something we're trying to look on a federal level of upping that age, which means then I will have to change. We got to change New York, right? Mm -hmm. New York and North Carolina, 16 age. But, but those are some of the things we would like to work on. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Tina. Thank that you. Was really great. Um, Carolyn, I have some questions for you. <laughs> um, I'd love to know um, a little bit about your work with um, the girls that you work with through Streetlight USA and um, your work to help them heal and what work you've done to help heal yourself and um, be to the place where you are today. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I'm recognizing that because it is a new movement and this is all brand new and we finally have got some people in Arizona that's bold enough, strong enough, have enough love and enough care to take this issue on. And one of them people that I have is Cindy McCain. That's my Cindy, you know. That's my Cindy that, that's bold enough to step against pimp, see. You know, everybody, you know. <laughs> We have in Arizona what I think, what we're doing there and what's making our girls strong and what's giving our girls a voice is I believe, and every survivor should believe that in her state, they're leading the charge. Every survivor should feel that in her state, from the governor to the mayor to the council, the attorney general, the officers, the deep, the case workers, case managers, everybody should feel, because it's going to take everybody. I could not do this by myself. But however, I feel like we're all these scientists, and we've been given this task to, okay, now what do we need to combat this issue? What do we need to eradicate this issue? And everybody brought what they had to the, to, to, and put it in this pot. You say, okay, now we need love, we need hope, we're going to need finances, we're going to need homes, we're going to need mental health, especially because we, we're going to need these girls to be empowered. We're going, to need, we're going to need all these things. We're going to need to renew their mind. It's a lot of work. Whatever you have to bring, is you put it all in this week. So we all said, okay, okay, let's do it. Let's save these victims. Let's save these little girls. And we put all of this stuff in this big pot. And we're mixing up this potion. We got everything we need. But now we got to mix this potion up. And before I can help them, I have to be the first one to drink it. So we're forgetting that we're survivors 
before we became adults. And in order for me to get something, and, and I'm waiting where I see a set, and I'm waiting to see now, okay, I can bring these girls to this group, and we're in this group, and I'm telling them, what do you need? And they're telling me everything that they need, but the potion ain't been made yet. It's still, we're still making it. But we got all the right, the right seasons. We got hot sauce. We got everything. We got everything in Arizona, and I do. I, I, I feel like that. At my state, my vice, my mayor, the governor, everybody, attorney general, the senator, everybody have my back. But sometimes I feel like when I get there, I have nothing to offer because I still need to. And a lot of times we'll put these masks on. Survivors have a lot of masks. We'll put these masks on. I'll sit up here and I act like, oh, everything is good, but I don't want to lie. Mm -hmm. I sit on the city council on a, a committee that my Cindy leads, and I sit on this council, and I'm the survivor mm -hmm. that sit on this council, and I tell them. I, and they asked when I got on the council, what do, they asked each one of us, what do we have to bring to the table to this issue? And when it got to me, we, I sit on this council, we have doctors, we have attorney general, we have all these different people, legislators. And I sit there as a survivor, and I say, only thing I have is my experience, strength, and hope. So I try to be as honest, as raw, as real as I can be, because it's not about me. Mm. It's about those young girls that's going to die. Because see, what it took for me to get out of there is in, my, in Arizona, it was six women, survivors. They were all found dead. They had family, they had people that love them. And it was finding their bodies in railroad tracks, in alleys, um, in dumpsters. They was finding all these girls, and, they, and the way it was played out, oh, another prostitute found dead. Another drug addict prostitute found dead. Out of all them six women that they found, I knew four of them women. And one of them women was my oldest sister. And when they found my sister Janice and they found her dead, I cried out at a bus stop one night. And I said, I want out of here. And now... See, all of that time still need to be healed. Mm. And I still need to work on that. So now I have these young girls looking at me, and they think I'm something. And I love them, and they do. They really do think I'm something special when I walk on the property. And we had this group, Let's Rap. And I'm seeing their trauma, but what I'm actually seeing is my 15-year-old girl that was trafficked mm. is looking at their 15-year-old girl and understanding, I understand what they're going through, but I can't go in there as the adult because I have to go in there still as the 15-year-old girl and communicate with them on that level to let them understand because that's what reaches, that's how I reach them, is I make myself 15. I don't come in there you know, um, I'm trying to be their friend. I just go in there and let them know I understand your pain. And one of the things that's so hard is because we are a group home and we're a, lot, we're, we're a group home. So yeah, after we house them, we feed them, we buy them clothes, we buy them nails and hair, whatever they want. We have yet to touch that trauma. I do not want another survivor, young kid, to leave no facility and their mental health has not been touched. Because as a survivor, I still suffer through mental health. That's one of the biggest things. Nobody touches the trauma. Okay, we fix them up, we pretty them up, and we get them their life back together, but then all you got, got now is a dressed up garbage can. That having the, it's all pretty. But our girls need so much help. And the main thing is how do we, because you can either have a license for a group home or a therapeutic center. And what I'm finding is that you need both of them. You need to address the trauma that the girl's been through. So that's the main thing we need is how can we put them two together? Thank you. And that was so great because you answered my next question too, all in one, which was gonna be, um, you know, what, what do we need? How do we give people that courage and that hope? And um, 
I love that um, what you said is that you become 15 with them again and connect in that way to give them that courage and hope. Um, You've had a lot of honors for all of your work and your successes. Um, you've been honored by Arizona's governor, the mayor of Phoenix, the Arizona attorney general. Uh, see, they do have your back. <laughs> um, have you seen a change in the way that human trafficking is handled in Arizona um, since you've been working with um, government and government officials? And um, if so, what are those changes that you've seen? The biggest change I've seen is with our with our vice officers. That's the biggest change. Is they came in at first, a lot of our, and I've had the opportunity to speak on panels with our vice officers. Um, I think that's is the outlook, the mindset of what they see. It used, they used to have a frame when I was out in the streets, when I was on Van Buren in Arizona, it was like, okay, they added to, well, let's go arrest as many prostitutes as we can and get them off the streets. And, and, you know, just get them away. You know, they're messing up the neighborhood. Now I see our vice officers are more concerned and they're more understanding. We still have some work to do, but we have some vice officers that have said, not on my watch. Mm -hmm. Will you take children? And then I think that's what it took. And they was finding younger and younger girls. And they didn't know what to do with them. So now we are... Um, one of the things that, that's one of the biggest things I've seen. And we've crossed all kind of lines and different things. And we all, and in Arizona, we've taken this attitude. It don't matter if you believe like I believe. Do you care about what I care about? Do you care that right now while I'm here in Washington, in Arizona, there's a young girl that's being trafficked for the first time tonight? Mm. Do you care about that? It doesn't matter to us. It don't matter. We want this issue, we want this issue eradicated. And we want to be the frontline soldiers. We want to be the leaders. We want to partner with other organizations. It's like we have this thing where now we're all saying, okay, it's no, not about big I, little you. It's we all recognize that this is an issue. It's not about me. It's not about my organization. We don't want to duplicate organization. We want others to come alongside organizations like Street Life and partner with us. We don't, we don't, we, so we have the, the state that's coming with us that's trying to help us get laws in place, trying to help us get the healing that the girls got. If we, in fact, got the girls, why, what, if we got the girls, why are we continue to open up other houses when we haven't even found a cure for the girls we have? That's, I want to take care of those that's in our hands. And I want to strengthen them, and I want them to heal them, and I want one day them to be the three panels up here. That's my heart. And I have people in Arizona that support that, that we all come together. And that's the big thing. It's like we got everything we need. There's nothing lacking, nothing missing is that how do we unify what we have? How do we make it work so lives can be changed, mm -hmm. that laws can be changed, and that girls can live again and mm -hmm. dream again and be free and be able to look at self in the mirror and not see this failure, this broken person, this trauma girl, this drug addict, this prostitute, this throwaway, this molested child. I want them to see a warrior. I want them to see the beauty that they are. I want them to see that they fearless and wonderfully made. I want them to see how loved they are. And it's going to take us all in Arizona and everywhere to come together and show that we love each other, that we support each other. It ain't no big eyes and little youths. It's like we want to be able, I want to be able to go to her state and her state and come here and, and, and say this is what we're doing. Survivors coming together. Saying this is what we need to do. And in Arizona, we do nothing without a survivor in it. We do nothing. They don't let no law get passed. They don't let no house get built. They don't let no funds get raised without a survivor. And not somebody just there to tell their story. Right. They want to know. Cindy asked me, she asked me, well, what do you think? I don't sit on that board and this Dr. Dominique and this um, attorney general, this person ain't this ghetto curly, you know, it's, I don't just sit there. They want to know my opinion. They ask and they listen to me and it makes me feel love. And Claire, you know, 
they make me feel safe enough to be honest and be real. I don't want to sit here and put a face on for y'all. I was scared to come here. I was really afraid. And then when it got counseled, I kind of like, okay. <laughs> mm. But I remember a year ago, my Cindy said, she said, Carolyn, I want you to think about going to Washington. We had just, we was at the city hall. We did something at city hall. And she said, I want you to think about going to Washington. I ran home, told my mom, Cindy McKay said, I'm going to Washington. Cindy McKay going, you know, my mom, and every day for a year, when you going to Washington? When you going to Washington? <laughs> And so I couldn't tell her I was coming here for a long time. And so now I'm here. And it was the, the, as the mentality is fear set in. Fear. Now what you going down there for? You're going, this going to happen, this going to happen. And it's about me conquering. I want, that's what I want for our girls at Street Light, is to feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I want them. And, and I was afraid to come here. I got this fear. All fear. And it wasn't a doe curling that was afraid. It was a little girl curling that was afraid. Well, tell little girl Carlton that you just moved me to Arizona. <laughs> She's like, I don't well, know. Well, I might wrote. be coming back with you. So let's do this. <laughs> yeah, I'll take you. But I'm just honored that, you know, if I can say anything, it's like I am very proud of my state. Probably very proud of my organization. I'm very proud to be a part of this movement. I'm honored that I got real women that understand my pain. Automatically, when I saw them, it's like something in me jumped. Mm -hmm. I see me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Anne, I have some questions for you. Sure. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, you have been. Um, on the front lines working with um, girls who have been exploited um, for many years. And I want to know something about, tell me some of the hardest parts of your job. What are the biggest challenges that you, that you have day to day? Um, I think the hardest part for me or the most challenging part is watching a girl go through the stages of change and the relapse process yes. and being powerless over her over in her process because recovery from exploitation is like a roller coaster mm -hmm. and so it, it's up it's down and when she's in that down just being powerless and being and just know to stay in position for when she's ready to to, to move on in her recovery mm -hmm. that's the hardest part is, is mm -hmm. just dealing with the challenges and the barriers that she faces in her process mm -hmm. that's the hardest part mm -hmm. that's the hardest part um, and what is kind of the best or most fulfilling, what's the most rewarding for you in your day to day? Um, you know, looking into a young person's eyes and seeing the hope restored in their eyes yes. and seeing the light come on and they begin to believe that they can change, that there's hope, um, that they're not alone and that um, it's going to be okay. It's going to be a process, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear more about um, your mentoring process and um, a little bit about how that works and mm -hmm. um, some of the programs that, that you do to really um, capture the power of survivor mentorship. Um, for, first and foremost, we are, we are survivors, but more than that, we are leaders. Right. So we're more than just survivors of exploitation. We are leaders in the movement. We are experts in the movement mm -hmm. of exploitation. We are. And so coming from that perspective, we want to bring to a young person. When I meet, when we meet, I'm going to slow it down because I direct the program now, <laughs> but I used to be the intake coordinator. So you'll hear me like move all over the place because, uh, and I also was a mentor. And um, what we do is we meet the young person, our intake coordinator goes out, she tells that, that young person a little piece of her story based on what she's read about that person. She's gonna give them a little snapshot of who she is and what services we provide. And it's voluntary. So a youth that wants the service, the service is provided. Although, you know, DYS and you know the courts and different people may stipulate them, it's pretty much voluntary and we've very rarely, I think maybe we've had two or three girls that did not want the service. But um, when the mentor, when the coordinator meets her, she does, she 
goes through that process and then she pairs her with a survivor um, who then meets her and meets with her weekly, sometimes more often than that, based on what that young person needs. Um, she will connect her to other services. She will meet with her, take her to eat, do some things that maybe she's never done before, um, which is really important. Um, when I first started working for My Life, My Choice, our associate director, Audrey Morrissey, um, brought me on, and um, we were like, she was the first mentor, and she kind of showed me what to do, and I remember we would take them everywhere, like <laughs> the finest restaurants. We were like spending all kinds of money um, because we just wanted this young person to know that she's worth, she's valued, um, simply because she is, not because she has to do something. We don't expect anything right. from you. And one of the things you have to be able to do is to fill that void that the pimp filled um, for lack of a better way to say it, you have to give them that love, but right. it's more, um, it's real, it's not fake, it's not on the presumption that they're going to do something, but be there for them simply because they're worth it. And so, yeah. Excellent. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's great. Um, if you could make a wish list, a dream about the kinds of tools and resources that you wish were more easily available, that there are more, there's more need for these resources and tools um, for girls and survivors to heal and recover. Mm -hmm. what, what would that be? Um, I think, of course, we need um, more funding to have more people to survive, provide the service, so more funding for mentors to work with youth. Mm -hmm. But also, really, in Boston especially, our human trafficking unit is, is for, for detectives. Um, and that's it. Um, it's very small. Um, I think there needs to be more funding for law enforcement to work um, in human trafficking, to um, educate them, to help them understand how to work with the youth, but also put the money for, to have enough detectives and different people on it to really raise awareness, but also put an impact on the demand, to also address the demand. Um, I think that we tread very lightly with uh, perpetrators. I don't understand that. I don't understand that, how we tread so lightly and we're so concerned about how they feel. Mm. Like, um, that blows me away. <laughs> that a young girl's life is changed forever if she survives. Right. It's changed forever. And you want to say that you want to make sure that him and his family is okay. Well, he should have thought about, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Or even no. the conversations they tell you when they in there, would mm -hmm. you? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Like, it's just amazing to That's me. Right. So I think that we need to put more money on education. I think we need to hold more people accountable for the parts that they play. Silence equals agreement, okay? Wow. When you say nothing, you say it's okay. And that's not, that's not okay with me. I don't wanna keep going. I'm that's feeling good. my blood start. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, yeah, let me, Usa. okay. <laughs> Okay, right. so I, I did have another question for you, okay. but I also got the sign that we have five minutes left. Okay. So we're, we're supposed to move into, I, I got cut off from my questions so that they can answer questions. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> but we'll, um, we'll take audience questions. And um, there's- i tell you, that sound reminds me of home. That's Chicago <laughs> wind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there a question? There's a question right here. How can government bureaucracy and professionals help you? And is there instances where they hinder you because of regulations prevent you from doing what in your heart you need to do? One of the ways is, is because we have a stigma on us as prostitutes, when we go to get a job, we cannot we cannot, we can't work because that's one of the things that once they see that, we need that off the, off the record where we don't have to identify and say that we're a prostitute or put that when you go for a job. And I think one of the things they can do is like they have these things for people that have um, disabilities that if you hire a girl that's, um, that's uh, sex, uh, you know, that have been sexually violated or whatever. I think we can have jobs that special things like that too. 
Well, give us a chance. Give us a chance. We some of the hardest, loving, working, honest people. If we just given a chance, we can do great things. We can build things. We, we business women. We, we <laughs> bottom girls, okay? Oh, we, Lord. We, we know how to, we, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we're brilliant. And these young girls that are, we, they're brilliant girls. We just need an opportunity to, to um, just get a, just give us a dream again. Give us a chance again. Um, you know, I think being on a White House advisory board for the mm -hmm. policy piece, I'm excited about because we get to work on some of the things she's speaking about, vacate mm -hmm. um, of charges, yeah. which I had to get mine uh, vacated too. Every state is different, so it's actually <laughs> harder than you think. Yes. Um, it is, yes. and it took years. Also, one of the things that people don't think about, you ask me, I work a lot with a lot of government officials, but one thing people don't. One of the things I actually had to do that took about four or five years to do was clean my credit because when I was trafficked, the trafficker put a house in my name. Right. Put cars in my name at yes. 14 and 15. Girl. There's no law. There wasn't, you know, Ugh. you get your identity stolen, that's fine, but there was no law. It took me years right. to clean that up to prove I was only 14 and didn't have my house. <laughs> um, so, and, and I think we're not thinking of that. So policy into place for that because they ruin not only you, your credit, you know, you mm -hmm. can buy a social security. Mm -hmm. double. It's pretty easy, yeah. but they sell ours. Um, for me, I think that we just need to get our heads out our butts because, mm -hmm. you know, we decided a long time ago in this country that it wasn't okay to sell a person, right? right. We abolished slavery, right? So this is a human rights issue. So I don't know That's what the what the big deal is, like, what do we need to do? It's human right. It's my human <laughs> right to be treated with dignity Amen. and respect and not be sold. That's my right. And I don't understand why we have to just keep going around and talking about it. Talk about what? <laughs> what? We're human. It is not okay. And I think if we begin to hold the people with the power that buy it accountable, yeah. we'll get somewhere. But until we, until we really look at that <laughs> and stop sugarcoating it and stop sweeping it under the rug and stop acting like it's not there, Oh, how many more girls have to die? And right. Boys. And how boys. many more girls and, have to die? And, and boys, gay, and transgender and youth. How many children? How many? how many children have to die in this country? Because I know it's an international issue, but my concern, it's right here. Hmm. And I'm so, like, it's not, it's right here. It's, it's not hidden. And I think no. if I hear that one more time, I'm going to scream. Because yeah. it's not hidden. No, it's it? not. It's in we just don't know what we're looking day. at. We say it's not. We judge someone. We say that that street, that's something yeah. else. We say that. So it's always been in our face, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. But we, in our heads, try to make it something else so we can justify why yes. we didn't help. Mm -hmm. And then don't get it misunderstood neither just because you see three African Americans sitting here. One of the things that, that, that people really is missing, the ones that's most as the risk is the one that say, this wouldn't happen to my daughter. Right. Well, this in doesn't this happen in my neighborhood. This doesn't happen. It's just that we found our voice in, you know, because a lot of us die at the age of 33. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's our lifespan. And I was thinking, why am I still sending my son? Cause she could have picked anybody from my state to come here, anybody. So I feel chosen, I feel honored that I get the opportunity to be a voice for this issue. But that's understand that this, this is just not a black thing, a white thing, a Hispanic thing, a native, a foreign thing. This thing don't care who it hurts. And one of the reasons why in Arizona, why it did come to Arizona, because there was a young, um, there was a young woman that they found. They came from Scottsdale, had a nice home. It's girls, this is happening in youth churches everywhere. This thing don't care who it takes out. These predators don't care who they take out. So please, please, and it's the girl, what I think that's most at risk is the one parent that says, that would never happen to my daughter. And that doesn't happen in this neighborhood. If your child got an internet, it probably can happen in your neighborhood or it can probably happen in your home. 
Because now my daughter got everything. She has the purses and the clothes and the shoes and all of that. She doesn't have But what do them. she have? She doesn't have it from them. The person yes. who gave it to them. They didn't give it to them. It's right. not about things. It's about that feeling, right? Yes. The person that's that saying predator. they care, that predator, even that female best friend. And don't think they say, this is not a bad man, bad man thing, neither. It's bad women that's doing this to young girls. It's other young girls that are doing this to young girls. It's mothers doing it to daughters. His uncle's violating because he wants some hair run, so he pimp out his little niece to get some hair run. So this is not a bad, bad, bad man. Okay. So I think we have okay. time for one last question. Yeah, got me. Right. You got a bunch of preachers on the pool. Yeah, come come on now. <laughs> <laughs> I just you wanted, messed me up. I wanted to ask and just raise the issue of what can be done more um, legislatively, politically, on the foster care issue, which pretty much Tina knows pretty well, but, you know, 60, 70 percent are coming out of the foster care system. So that's obviously broken, and what can we do to fix it so that it, we don't have girls being trafficked from foster care? And so that statistic isn't even right, right? Because it's only girls that that statistic mm -hmm. is right. for, and not even a boy's. And I right. want to say that because, so people always ask me, how many girls, how many boys do you have? I always started working with boys, so I'm going to have the same exact numbers. Right. Because of my trafficking situation, family control inside of foster care, boys were trafficked right along with me. Right. Yeah. So everybody's different. One, we need to understand that. Yeah. So this, the reason I said that is this. Boys are not getting identified. A hundred percent of my boys are in the foster care system. That's why I made that statement. A hundred percent, not a hundred percent of my girls, but a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the boys were in a foster care system starting between the ages of six and ten. That's when their trafficking situation started, but it came in as child sexual abuse. The right questions weren't answered, so right. when they get to me at 13, 14, and they disclose, that was the original situation from the beginning, so that trauma mm -hmm. hasn't been touched. That's right. <laughs> the worker doesn't even know about it. No. Nope. So the right identification goes back to... At Courtney's house, there are four paradigms of sex trafficking. So are the assessments. So we cannot ask someone who is being pimped out by a family member if they have a pimp. Because that's not the terminology right. that that's they right. use. That's right, exactly. So it's about using the right terminology, not changing their terminology to fit ours. Yeah, that's good. But changing our terminology to fit theirs, and also the paradigms, the rules. That way we can identify. So I'm actually pushing that more of what we're using to identify. And again, that statistic is just girls. And so actually boys have severe mental health issues. Yeah. Most of my boys are actually schizophrenic. That's right. Um, and so that's not even being touched on either of the severe mental health. And I, 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 my issue wasn't drugs. My issue was mental health too. Mm -hmm. So that's a humongous issue. So I would like to attach that. I get a lot of referrals from foster care to be very honest, an awful lot. But what I see is I would love them to work with me. It's That's great, right. like the social exactly. worker drops it off on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, thank you, I'm so happy if I saw it. I have 40 other kids. I'm like, I got 52 other though. Okay. <laughs> right. So I think better collaboration within the foster care. But um, we are gonna put up some, in April 16th, again, is the big spot meeting at the White House. And so that's when we're gonna put out more of the federal plan for that, which will actually write it out more of what we're gonna focus on in policy. I think right. also that um, foster care providers, um, uh, providers and the workers need to be educated. A lot of them don't know about exploitation. They think they do know about child sexual exploitation. They don't. Um, they send referrals that say things like promiscuous and she's this and he's that. And it's mm -hmm. not Keep true. It and for boys, if they you still refer as a prostitute. I do want right. to say that. Girls are not saying that. But for boys, when they refer to me, they still say that. Well, um, but the majority of our workers still use words like prostitution, which implies choice in that these yeah. kids, and there's, there is no choice. And so we change our language. We don't call it um, prostitution. And we educate. Every time I speak to a DCF worker, a Department of Children and Families worker, I change the language. I say we call that exploitation. We don't call that prostitution. Right. And I don't call it the life. Myself, I call it exploitation. It's mm -hmm. not a life. And That's it's, right. It's like this whole little, oh, I was in the life. It sounds like it's lollipops and daffodils. No, it's a life of exploitation. It's a life of horrific trauma. And we, need, we can do more if we begin to help people address it for what it really is and stop calling it these things that make it sound like it's okay, that it's acceptable, because it's not. It's not.
Well, I want to thank these amazing thank women, and uh, hopefully you guys will help me. I think they deserve a standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you guys for everything you've done. Thank you, and thank you guys, thank you. everyone. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Can you take a picture with us and Cindy? Okay. Moderating? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think what you, you saw in this discussion is how important it is to listen to the voices of victims. Uh, it's not your personal stories. It's what you can teach us. And I think we all got a tremendous amount out of this today. I want to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, please stay connected with us, uh, McCainInstitute.org. Uh, we will continue this conversation series, and we will continue to raise awareness and to push for solutions on human trafficking. I want to thank all of you for coming, and thank especially all of you for being with us. Thank you, Cindy, for helping give this such a lift as you've done all this time. Thank you. And that concludes the program for today.